Today is a special day, and it's bigger than we think. Because there are many different kinds of fathers, and they all need to be recognized and honored today. Today, we honor those fathers who consistently strive to balance loving their wives and children with being good, godly workers at their jobs. May you feel the pleasure of God. Today, we honor those dads who had poor fathers themselves, but who have committed never to become the father they grew up under. May your children continue to be guarded from any of the hurt you carry. Today, we honor the fathers who are older and who no longer have day-to-day -day obligations to their own children. May the family gatherings this weekend make you feel like you could do it all over again. Today, we honor the adult children of fathers who are absent. May the God of the fatherless become your father in ways you've only dreamed of. And may you believe with your whole heart that his leaving wasn't your fault. Today, we honor men who have no children of their own, but who father younger men as mentors and guides. May you see your important roles as impacting and life-changing. And finally today, we honor fathers who have passed away. May their good deeds live on through you, and may their careless deeds be corrected in your lifetime. Today is a special day. So for all the fathers we mentioned, and even those we didn't, be honored, be blessed, and be joyful. We believe that you have what it takes to change the world, and you're doing it one relationship at a time. Happy Father's Day. Well, good morning. It's great to be able to see faces um, and welcome you as well, as well as welcome those of you who will be joining us um, by live stream. I want to welcome you on this Father's Day and wish you a happy Father's Day. Um, as this video that we began depicted, we're honoring all of our fathers and uh, we're thankful for whatever stage of fatherhood you're in. And we're, we're honoring you and praying for you today as a church. We're also um, entering into a new phase in the life of our church, and so we're excited to be able to be having an outdoor service. And it was beautiful weather, a little humid, but more or less it was a wonderful day, and we had a great crowd out to be able to enjoy the outdoor service. And now we're starting to have people here on our indoor service, and we're having our band perform live. So that's all exciting. So we are moving forward. We're making progress. As a church, we're going to continue to meet 9 a.m. for our outdoor service and then 10.30 for our indoor service. And you just follow the website for more information as we continue to move forward as a church. But whether you're joining us here live or live stream, we welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ. During this crisis, we have been focusing our prayer lives on seven key areas of prayer. And it's important for us, even as we begin to see changes and begin to be reopening and moving forward, to not stop, to, to never stop praying, to keep moving forward in prayer. Because our country needs prayer. This pandemic has shown us that. The racial unrest has shown us that. But we've always needed prayer, even more so today. And so, would you join me in prayer as we pray for our nation, as we've been doing throughout this whole crisis and want to continue to do? Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. As we honor our earthly fathers, we also honor and praise our Heavenly Father. As Jesus taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You are worthy of our praise and we honor you and worship you as the Heavenly Father who cares deeply about us, your children. We ask now for the needs of the people that we know. We pray for those who are still sick, some with the COVID virus. Others are mourning the loss of loved ones. We think especially of the Ball family and their loss. 
We're thankful for many who have been healed, who had the disease and have recovered so many, and we're so thankful for them. We ask you to continue to be with the healthcare workers as they're on the front lines, and we pray your blessing upon them and our first responders and all those who have done so much during this time. We ask your blessings upon them. Lord, we pray for those who are vulnerable, those who are vulnerable to disease, but also experiencing vulnerability emotionally and socially as they're isolated. We pray that as we begin to move more toward a reopening, that we can be helpful and, and guide people in moving forward and feeling more at ease and more comfortable. We pray your blessing upon those who are still unemployed and hoping to get back to work. We pray for more opportunities for people to be able to be working and living and enjoying life. We pray for our leaders, for our governor, for our president and our mayor and our chief of police, so many different challenges they are facing in this time. We pray you give them wisdom, help them to govern us in a way that is honorable and pleasing in your sight, and we lift them up to you. We pray for our students and our families who are finishing out and have finished out the school year. We pray for an opportunity for them to get a break this summer, but we pray that you would guide the leaders of our school districts as they plan for next semester. For those that are going back to college, we pray for them as they head back uh, and live on campus. We pray for safety for them. And we pray for our church as we begin to reopen, re regather uh, outside, in, indoor, and over the internet. We can continue to be a source of encouragement to one another in the days ahead. Give us wisdom, guide and lead us. For we pray in the name of your son, Jesus, our Savior, and all of God's people said, amen. It's good to hear a couple amens. Usually it's just the live streams, the guys in the back, and, uh, but we're getting there. Uh, I want to start with a call to worship, and then we're going to be singing. Psalm 100. Here's the call to worship. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's worship and sing together to the Lord.
our story, right? We're praising our Savior all the day long. benefit of the lyrics on the screen so thank you Jennifer for being here all that we need comes from Christ so let's wind down before our message with this favorite song of ours you have
Well, good morning again, and happy Father's Day. There we go, just untangle myself here. We're glad you can be with us here on Father's Day, and uh, we want to turn to God's Word now as God's people, and uh, glad that you can be with us today. Let me just open up this sermon time with prayer. Father, guide our hearts and our minds. Help us to look to your Word today to find answers to find direction. Help us to hear and apply what you have for our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Ever since Windows began with Windows 95, I've been a Windows 95 user. Some of you here today, looking at some of our younger ones, don't even know what Windows 95 is. But it was the, right? Right? So it was the beginning of the computer age. It looked a lot different than it does today. And it was the greatest thing when it first started, wasn't it? I'm looking for some of the older people. Brent, shaking his hand back there. We all remember the days of Windows 95. But here is the problem. One thing I learned is that it was buggy. And oftentimes it would lock up. And so what would you do? Control, Alt, Delete. It solved everything. You just reboot and you cross your fingers and hope that when the windows loaded again, it would be better. Today, we're actually starting a sermon series called Reboot. Reboot is what we're actually doing as a country right now. We are in the process of rebooting after a pandemic. Individually, Perhaps you are in the process of rebooting as well. You're going from what your life was as the pandemic struck to now moving into what will lie ahead, the new normal. And as a church, we're starting to gather publicly. We gathered outdoor today. It was wonderful to be outside, to be sharing God's word, to be singing And now we're beginning to gather indoor after 12 weeks of being only live stream and virtual groups. So we are rebooting. And as we think about what it means to reboot, I want to actually think with you about it by using 1 Peter as a guide for us as we reboot. 1 Peter is an interesting book written by the Apostle Peter, and it will give us a framework for how we can reboot our lives Um, If you open up in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, you'll see that Peter, an apostle of Christ Jesus, wrote this letter. Now, if you think about it, there's probably no person that more needed to reboot his life at times than the apostle Peter. The apostle Peter was very good at putting his foot in his mouth, like me, and, and sometimes when that happens, you need to reboot. You need to start again. You need to do a do-over. The Apostle Peter had to do a number of reboots, a number of restarts, control all the lead of his life and start it over. You remember one time when he was with Jesus before, right before Jesus died and Jesus was warning the disciples that they would all scatter, they would all run when he was arrested. And of course, Peter stood up and his proud way and said, if all of them deny you and abandon you, I will never. Well, you know how that story ended. And Peter needed to reboot his life. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, Jesus approached Peter and said, okay, let's have a reboot. Spiritual control, all delete. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times he asked Peter, that question to reboot, because three times he denied the Lord. And so Peter had a reboot. Peter was a man who personally knew what it was, what it was like to reboot after failure. And he's writing to God's elect, God's people, and it says, scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Where in the world is that? Well, it's in modern day Turkey today. It was the region sort of northwest of Israel. And in those days, there were Jews that had scattered 
away from Jerusalem and had settled in various towns in the Roman Empire. Some of these Jews became followers of Jesus Christ. They became Messianic Jews. And the gospel also went to Gentiles as well. And so this gospel message went to Jew and Gentile and they gathered together in God's church and churches were started all across the Roman Empire. In several of these churches, the apostle Peter connected with them and was able to share with them this letter of encouragement. Now it's interesting, he's writing to God's people who are physically scattered away from from Jerusalem, but there's a sense in which, and I know I'm using the word not exactly the way Peter meant it, but there's a sense in which as we begin this study of First Peter, we are writing to people who are scattered. I mean, socially distant, scattered. Scattered because many of us are still home. Scattered because our lives have been turned upside down. There's a sense in which as we are scattered about because of this pandemic, it's God who is speaking to us and calling us together. And so it's, I think it's an appropriate book for us. Not only the author understood what it meant to reboot, but the people who were scattered in some ways needed comfort from God that, that, they, that God still cared about them even though they were scattered far flung in the empire. And so too, God cares about us God cares about you who are watching at home. God cares about us who are here. Even though we're scattered and we haven't seen each other and we feel isolated, God still cares about us and he still speaks to us today. And so this book, 1 Peter, will be very helpful for us as we do this reboot. As we study the book of 1 Peter, we're going to discover four building blocks um, throughout this book reinforced that teach us about what the process of rebooting our lives looks like. There's four building blocks that we'll see throughout 1 Peter's letter. What are those building blocks? Becoming. We have to understand what our identity is in Jesus Christ. We have to know who we are, who we belong to. If we're going to reboot our lives, even after a pandemic or after a failure, whatever the situation is, we need to know who we are in Jesus Christ. We need to understand who we're becoming because God is at work in our lives. We have to keep believing God's promises to us as we regather, as we restart our lives. We have to believe what's God's promises for us. And that involves our thinking. We have to allow our thinking to be influenced by God's word and God's truth and not by lies that are out there. We need to sort through the distortions of reality and focus in on what God says about our lives. We need to reboot our lives by believing God's promises. But we also need to reboot our lives as we are belonging, building relationships and relating one to another. And in a sense, we're almost starting fresh. For many of us during this crisis, our only interaction have been through the virtual groups and through live stream and through drive-bys and seeing people. And in a sense, we almost have to relearn what it means to relate to one another in meaningful ways. But we're going to do that because God has called us to be belonging to one another. And in 1 Peter, we'll see this important element that we belong to God and we belong to one another. And therefore, God has called us into community, called us to relate. And throughout 1 Peter, we'll see that building block of a belonging to each other as an important building block as we reboot our lives. And the fourth building block is behaving. Yeah, I... Tried to come up with all B's. I don't know how I did. But in any event, um, it's sometimes helpful to think about different things and come up with the same letters. But believing, we need to have lives that reflect the gospel. Increasingly, if we've learned anything from this crisis, we've learned increasingly that we live in an age where when you believe the gospel and when you stand up for Jesus Christ, you're different. We need to be different. The world needs to see those of us who are truly committed to Jesus Christ, living a life, faithfully living a life that pleases God, distinguishing us from those around us. And 1 Peter is a clarion call for us to be behaving in a way that reflects who we are in Jesus Christ. And as we go through this letter, we'll see time and time again that 
Peter urges us, like 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, I urge you to abstain from sinful desires. Throughout the letter, we'll see this call to behave in a way that pleases God. All of these four building blocks are essential for us as we think about what it means to reboot our lives. But in some ways, we have to get the order right or else we're going to be putting ourselves in a situation that's unfair. What do I mean? Well, I want you to think about someone who is sickly. Let's assume, just for an analogy, that someone has a heart, a bad heart. In fact, they, they, they have a, a heart valve that is defective. And because that heart valve is defective, it's not pumping the blood through the chambers right, and that person is constantly weak and constantly out of breath and constantly unable to do what they normally used to do very well. They have a sick heart. Would it be, would it be unfair of me if I were the doctor to say to that person who has a sick heart, who needs a, a, a surgery to fix it, to, needs a new heart valve, to say to that person, well, you know what? I'm not sure we're going to give you the surgery yet. Let's, let's let you go through rehab first. Let's see if you can make it on your own. Let's see if you can get yourself better by yourself. Just start working in the gym and start working out and let's see how you do. And then maybe, maybe we'll think about the surgery. You'd, you'd say to me as a doctor that I was, I was, I was bad. I was mean. I'm, I'm Malpractice, right? You have to fix the heart first before you do the rehab. The rehab follows the surgery, right? So why is it that sometimes we preach to people, behave, 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 before they've been changed? Before they've been born again, we're trying to have them act as if they're born again. We're telling people who don't know Christ have not received the new heart through faith in Jesus Christ. This is how God wants you to live. Whenever we do that, we're just preaching moralism and legalism. We're not preaching the gospel. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, says to sick people, you need a new heart. And so the focus has to be on who you are becoming in Jesus Christ and inviting people to receive Christ, to begin that journey, to receive a new heart, to be born again. And as they receive that, then we begin to teach them how to behave in a way that pleases God because now they have the ability to do so with a new heart. And I want you to notice that's exactly how 1 Peter begins Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, and you'll see that Peter starts out by sharing the gospel and saying that the triune God, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is committed to rebooting our lives from sin to salvation, and that God's plan is to bring it about, but God has a definitive plan. Look at what it says about the role of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit in that work of rebooting and changing our lives. First, look at God the Father. Notice what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. It says that God has a plan for our transformation. You see, God wants to change our lives, and He has a plan to bring about a transformation of our lives. God the Father has a plan. God the Son provides the means for us to be changed, and God the Holy Spirit purifies us. First, God the Father. Notice what it says. God the Father plans for a believer's transformation. Look at what it says in verse 2. Who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Do you know, you and I have to understand who we are. We have to understand that we're becoming a child through faith in Jesus Christ. And therefore, we have to understand that God has called us and has a plan for our lives. He's chosen us. How has He chosen us? According to His foreknowledge. What does that mean? For, before, knowledge, knowledge before. Do you know what that means? That means before you were born, before your parents were born, before their parents were born, and on and on and on, God the Father had a plan before it all and knew you intimately. 
He had a, a plan for your life. What's his plan involve? It involves taking you from sin to salvation. It involves taking you and transforming you and rebooting your life and changing you from someone who is sick with sin to someone who experiences a new life and a rebirth in Jesus Christ. God the Father had a plan and He chose us before the creation of the world. That's what the Scripture teaches. On Father's Day, we think about our fathers and for many of us, to think about our fathers is a pleasant thought. And we think about how our earthly fathers planned for our arrival before we were born. From the minute their wives said, I'm pregnant, they began to plan and think about, oh, how will it be when we have our little one? And what plans I have for my child. So many of us have some positive memories of our fathers. We had wonderful fathers in our lives, and we can give thanks on Father's Day because we had an earthly father who planned for our lives. But there may be some today who have had less than the best father figure. And so it may be harder for us to think about a father who plans and guides our lives, but that's exactly what God our Father does for us. He has planned for our lives. He knows us intimately, and He is planning for us to experience change in our lives. That's the first step, the first part of what God is doing in our lives to bring us to salvation in Jesus Christ. God the Father has planned. And it's important to understand, as the Scripture teaches, that God is not only one who plans, but takes the initiative. Maybe you know the story, the prodigal son in, in, in Luke chapter 15. Jesus told the story of a prodigal son, a son who took all that he had and he went off, took his father's inheritance and went off and spent it lavishly and wasted it all away and then finally came to his senses, right? And as he's making his way back, what does it say? The father saw him when he was still a long way off and ran to him. The truth of the matter is, is that pictures us as, as children who have wandered from God because of sin. And God the father saw us and he reacted to us and he ran to us. God took the initiative in our life. The reason you're experiencing change if you're a Christian is because God the Father planned it and He reached out to you before you were looking for Him. That's what the Bible teaches. It teaches that God our Father loves us, knew us before the creation of the world and has a plan for our lives. We can take joy in knowing that God has it all planned. God knew there was going to be a pandemic and God knew he was going to bring us through it. And God knows how he's going to bring us through it all the way to the end. We can trust our God as a father who plans for his children in a loving way. But I want you to also notice that the scripture also teaches that Jesus Christ has a role in our transformation. Notice what it says. God the Son provides the atonement necessary for our transformation. Look at what it says. To be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. God the Father had a plan for us from all eternity. And, and He was planning your salvation. He was planning the day when you would trust in Christ and begin this journey of change in your life that I hope that you're going through right now. And if you're not, you can start today. But of course, the only way that that plan could be carried out was for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. Only when the eternal Son took on flesh and blood and lived among us and lived that perfect life that we couldn't live, and at the end of that life offered Himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And when He was on that cross and His blood was spilled, He was providing the atonement necessary for us to have a new start, to have a reboot. In Jesus' death, His death paid the penalty for our sins. His death washes away all our sins. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Jesus purifies us from all sins. That's how we begin and that's how that process of 
is started in our lives when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. The death of Jesus Christ is, is covering our sins and we receive the forgiveness of God. And so God the Son provides the atonement necessary for us to experience a, a reboot in our lives, to go from sin to salvation, to experience new life. It's through the death of Jesus Christ that that happens. And I want you to notice the Apostle Peter says that we are sprinkled with His blood. Seems a little weird. But if you think about the Old Testament, the Old Testament priest on the Day of Atonement would sprinkle the blood of the heifer to signify that the blood is being spread on and toward all people. And in that sense, that's the language that Peter is using to describe that the blood of Jesus is sprinkled on us. It covers all of us. We're all included in it. And it's through the death of Jesus Christ and the atonement that he provides that we can have a new start. The reboot that we long for in our lives is available because God the Father has planned it and God the Son has provided the means of forgiveness and for us to start a new life. But let's not forget that God the Holy Spirit also plays a vital role in our reboot. Notice what Peter says that this experience of, of transformation that we have in our lives happens because God, the Spirit, purifies the believer on our way to transformation through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. What does that mean, sanctifying? That's a word we don't use that often in our days other than in church settings. And so the word sanctify comes from that Latin word sanctus which means holy. So sanctifying means to be made holy. When a person believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, they are born again, and the Holy Spirit at that moment comes to live inside of an individual. And the Holy Spirit, therefore, is sanctifying, is helping a person to experience new life, to be changing that person from the inside out. Like I said, if we're sick, we need someone to go inside of us, a surgeon, and to fix us. Well, sick with sin, we need a new heart, spiritual heart. We need a new life. The Holy Spirit comes to live in us, to make us alive, to give us new life, to give us new direction, to give us a new power we didn't have. And through that, to be able to change us from the inside out. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, to be sanctifying us. We're to keep in step with the Spirit, to be sure. But make no mistake about it, there is no rebooting of our lives unless the Holy Spirit is at work in us. And so, we need the work of the Father, the work of the Son, and the work of the Spirit, the triune God, three persons in one God at work in our lives. That is the reason we can have hope. That's the reason we can face the future and say, you know what? I can experience change. I can experience a reboot in my life. And as we continue to study First Peter, we'll see that we will be given a whole new set of directions for how to live together, how to work together as we go from being scattered people to being gathered people, belonging and behaving and believing. But the bottom line is, you and I need to become new people. So I want to, as we close today, ask you whether or not you have ever experienced a spiritual reboot. You've ever gotten to the point where you said, what I'm doing is not working. I'm stuck. Control, all delete. Let me start again. The Bible says that when a person calls upon the name of the Lord, they are saved. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you believe in your heart, that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that he is Lord, you will be saved. When was the day that you had that spiritual reboot when you gave control of your life over to Jesus Christ and allowed him to take control, allowed him through the work of the Spirit to cleanse you and to purify you? That's the date 
that all of us should have. And if we don't have that day, today is a day when we can experience that. Those of us who have experienced that in Jesus Christ, though, need periodic reboots. We know that sometimes our spiritual lives slow down, get sluggish, and even get stuck. And so perhaps this is a call for you and I today to experience a reboot as we study the letter of 1 Peter, we'll understand what those building blocks for reboot look like. But make no mistake about it, we need to give our lives over to the Lord and allow Him to change us. For only by experiencing that, that transformational change that God promises us, that God the Father planned, that Jesus Christ the Son provided, and God the Holy Spirit brings about as he sanctifies us, only that kind of change from the triune God will allow us to experience the reboot of our lives that will bring us from sin and death to salvation and life. It truly is crossing over from death to life. And in order to experience that, we need to embrace what God has done for us. Have you done that? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity today to think about our lives, to begin the process of physically rebooting as a church, as we gathered outside, as we begin to gather inside. We thank you for this opportunity that you give to us. But Lord, we are reminded that every single day we have an opportunity to reboot our lives and to be able to experience newness of life in you. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would speak to each person who's here and listening online that we could experience a reboot as we understand that God the Father has a plan for our lives. Let us rejoice that we have a loving Heavenly Father who through his foreknowledge has planned for us to experience this life of transformation and has sent his son who provides the redemption in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins and through your blood sprinkling us so that we are clean and washed and ready for your service. We thank you that through the power of the Holy Spirit living in us, we have the power and we have the purifying love to cleanse us from all sins and allow us to serve you. So Lord, I pray your blessing upon your people today. Pray if there be anyone here who has never started a relationship with you, that today would be the day to press control, alt, delete on their life and allow you to take over. Lord, I pray that for those of us who have been serving you, that we would understand that the times we live in, these challenging times, are an opportunity for us to show the world around us that we love you, that we can serve you, and we can let our lives be a light to others. And I pray that you would allow that to be so in our lives. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus, your Son, and God's people said, Amen. Let's stand as we close our service today. And fittingly enough, it's living hope. So I hope you can sing, Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. i
As you leave here today, I hope that you do enjoy your Father's Day. And again, we wish a happy Father's Day to everyone. Um, I want to leave you with this, this word of promise and uh, benediction, which is a fancy word for a good word as you leave here today, an encouragement to you. Hear that word of benediction. May your people who are called according to your plan, God the Father, know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord and be sprinkled by His blood to live an obedient life for Him, filled and purified by the Holy Spirit. May we go from this place and indeed to our lives that we live, living different lives, knowing that you've called us. Help us, Lord, as we reboot as individuals and as a church to carry the mission of Jesus to those around us. Give us courage, give us strength, give us hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.